know, it's interesting anyway when we've got Leslie on the show, but this will be extra interesting because... I've never spoken to anybody who was in the queue, and it's such a famous queue now that nobody says, well, which which queue are talking? Ah, oh, the really bad one at Gatwick Airport. No, we mean the queue. So, Leslie, you actually travelled down on Sunday, and you were in the queue. I was. I was. Good morning, Gareth. Yeah, what an experience. So, my daughter and I uh, thought we might do it. But as the week was going on and we saw the, the size of the queues and we were, I was at a conference all weekend anyway, um, but we got to Sunday lunchtime. We're like, let's go. And uh, and we travelled to London. We thought the queue might have been closed by the time we arrived. And we arrived at um, in London about half past three. So we thought Buckingham Palace had been closed. You couldn't get to all those venues. So we decided, let's just go to the beginning of the queue and see what happens. <laughs> so we did. And, and we arrived what? at... Well, I was just about. So you're in Birmingham, aren't you? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's halfway from Manchester. So uh, Birmingham, hence the name the Midlands, is basically in the middle between Manchester and London. So it would have been, even for you, maybe that's what, an hour and a half trip? Yeah, that's right. That's right. In fact, we were going from Cambridge and then we came back to Birmingham. But yeah, it's it's a, it's a, it's a trip. It's quite a hike. Um, but it was incredible, Gareth. Nine hours we queued, um, my, my daughter and I, um, and it was the most incredible experience. Um, <laughs> I mean, we joined the queue thinking, are we really doing this? But there was something that we were swept along by the atmosphere, um, how people were connecting with each other, um, just how people served you along the way. One of my favourite points was going past um, a number of houses and a lady had put a big sign outside her house going if you'd like to use our loo you can use it for free and there was just loads and loads of things like that where people were just being so kind and caring and looking out for one another and the thing that amazed me was in the nine hours my experience was that there was just undiminished thankfulness nobody got whingy nobody got grumpy it was just a a lot of thankfulness and reflection and getting to know each other, telling each other our stories. Um, I have a WhatsApp group now called the Queen's Q and we've made the <laughs> commitment that we're going to go to the coronation together. I wow. mean, honestly, it was amazing. I, mean, I, I did hear a few of these stories, but I thought that the media, they were just selecting happy people. Yeah. I thought that somewhere in that queue, there'll be people moaning. There'll be the miserable ones who would drag there. Could, Why did we come all this way? But, it, it does sound like sort of the queuing was part of the thing. It was oh. part of the experience. Yeah, absolutely. The queuing really was part of the experience because we were nine hours in a queue and then 10 minutes in Westminster Hall. It was, I mean, and that was incredibly, it was extraordinary, a poignant moment to to finish in Westminster Hall. Um, but the queue, the experience of the queue and the people that you met, the sense of who we are, as a nation coming together. And well, we also met people that traveled from across the world who were there as well. Um, but it was really very special, very special indeed. I'd have, I'd have so loved to have gone. And you know that feeling, uh, they say that uh, fear of missing out, don't they? <laughs> yes. I, let, I, I literally had that all last week because I couldn't go. My wife's heavily pregnant. And I was thinking that it is due on the 13th of October. But as you know, as a lady who's got children, it's unpredictable. <laughs> children <laughs> do not leave Manchester. <laughs> and I was there thinking that I do, I, I would have wanted to have paid my respects, but I want to be at my child's birth a little bit more than that because if I'd have <laughs> missed it, and then in a few years, uh, why was Daddy there at all the other ones but not mine? Well, he drove three hours to go and see the Queen. And I just... But like you, I did really want to go, and I was asking people around me, you actually did go. So just tell us again what it was like to actually walk through and to see Her Majesty lying in state. Well, it was interesting because the whole way round, you know, you're walking along the South Bank for hours and hours and hours. Then you cross Lambeth Bridge and then you have, you know, it was about a three hour wait, zigzags of kind of queues all the way. And the further you got, the closer you got, the more contemplative it became. I mean, partly it was one o'clock in the morning by that point. Um but it just got more reflective. People became a little bit more reflective as as we as we got closer. Then we got through security. 
Um, and then we were just literally standing outside the hall and then everyone went quiet, like super quiet. Before that, it had been a bit crazy because James Blunt was in the queue by us. And so everyone was very excited because James Blunt was in the queue. Hold on a minute. Um, How close were you to James Blunt? Oh, no, I have photos of me and James Blunt. Oh, you've got to send me. Right. Text me these <laughs> over when we finish, Leslie, because I really want to see these. Go on. So James Blunt, I just... It, it seems like the most surreal, bizarre experience. I'm so it was surreal. like David Beckham. There was James Blunt in the queue and all these people. So you've you've had your picture taken with James Blunt. I have. I've gone through security. Um, everyone that had makeup lost their makeup. <laughs> everyone was going, my mascara, um, because they were getting rid of everything. But anyway, we got to that point and we walked into the hall and then there was just it was just like a sacred place quiet nobody was speaking like that sense of reflection we've come for this moment to pay our last respects to the queen um and it was just really a profound experience of walking down into the hall walking slowly past and stopping by the um the queen's coffin um and and taking a moment to to be thankful and to uh you know both my daughter and I bowed our heads before we then walked out. So it was just, it was just an amazing experience. Strange in many respects. From you almost forgot what you were doing at points during the queue because you were chatting on, you were buying each other coffee, you were, you know, telling stories. But then you get to that moment, you realise, gosh, this is a really significant moment, an opportunity to thank someone, to thank God for someone uh, who has served so faithfully for so many years. Um, just amazing. I didn't think that the feeling of FOMO could get any worse. I thought that after the event, it would go. But now you're mentioning it, I feel even worse, the fact that I couldn't <laughs> go there. But my... So what I've been thinking is that there may be a possibility to actually go and, I suppose, pay our respects as a family mm. when they open up Windsor to the mm. public now of mm. course it won't be i guess as intimate or as close but you will know that you're in those surroundings so right. that's how i'm almost relieving myself <laughs> of the fomo that i've got because it does sound like it's memories were made and it was an experience that you'll never forget i'll never forget i'll never forget it and made with other people that um you've become friends with as well uh, just just amazing an opportunity to mark a very significant moment in our history as a nation in a very personal way. And that's what it felt like. We were with thousands and thousands of people, but it felt very personal um, and special. And I was very glad that they weren't rushing people through the hall. They really allowed people to take their time, take their moment. Um, and nobody complained. And nobody was rushed. It was it was really a beautiful, beautiful moment. And, and seeing the crown honestly go to the tower of london and see the crown jewels there is absolutely exquisite photographs the television can't do it justice it was absolutely exquisite well interesting about that crown because me being me i was searching the facts of it and how much it's worth and you know that it's priceless I know we use this phrase a lot, so, oh, it's it's priceless, but genuinely, it is a priceless item because mm. of the history and the fact what it's made of. But experts, and nobody's been allowed to actually evaluate it properly <laughs> close up. It's never been allowed this. Oh, I didn't know but that. from photographs and from videos, experts who are in that field reckon that if it was to be sold, if it was to be proper evaluated, it would be worth up to £5 billion. My £5 goodness. billion. Pounds. Now, that's taken into account the history of it. It's mm. taken into account the actual fact that I think it contains the second biggest diamond in the world. I think the first biggest is in the scepter. Yes, at the top of the scepter. Yes. The top of it. But five billion pounds, which is probably why it was actually on the coffin so <laughs> securely, <laughs> because yes, everybody nice. was asking, going, "Well, how's he held on?" Right. And then they actually discovered at the funeral how it was held on. Yeah. Now, what we're going to do? We don't usually do it in two sections, but uh, Leslie needs to have time to send me the picture of her and James Blunt. Uh, so, what we're going to do is to play a song, and we'll be back with Leslie after this. So 
if you do hear my phone vibrate, it's because Leslie has now sent, and it, oh, it's on its way. Okay, so I've got it here. Wow, it is actually. I know that you said it is James Blunt, but to see a photograph of you, James Blunt, is that his wife somewhere on there as well? She's right in the is back. That right? Yeah, she's right in the back. Um, and he's actually holding my phone. So, you know, <laughs> I'm famous because James Blunt held my phone. <laughs> so I was just saying a fact that you already knew, but James Blunt was part of, is he the team? The sort of soldier group who were watching over the coffin of Diana. So that must have been a really weird experience because presumably, and I can't remember this too much, but Diana was lying in state in the same place that the Queen was. Is that right? Um, I don't remember that. But no, I do, I yeah, I did read, I did read something about, um, yeah, he was in the forces and he was part of the protection. Amazing. And there you are in the queue. It does look like, you know, all the faces in the background, it's not faces of what you would expect from people usually in a queue. This is the thing, because like I've been in massive queues, like when we went to Glastonbury and all this kind of stuff, and there was queues and we were there just going like, oh, yeah. whereas that is, it just looks like there's so much enjoyment from yeah. everybody involved. So much energy, so much enthusiasm. Uh, just, yeah, wonderful. And of course, that marks the end of the Elizabethan era. And I want you to say, because I certainly can't pronounce it, what the next era is that we're now in. Well, maybe your listeners can correct us if we're wrong, but I think it's called the Carolean era. I think Carolean. it's the Carolean era. era. I may be wrong. I may have pronounced that wrong. Maybe your listeners can correct us. <laughs> I'd love to know yes. how they pick these because, you know, there would have been meetings going, uh, should we just call it the Charles era, Charles Arian, um, Charles Regina era? And it, I know. What's you weren't in that me? meeting, were you, what Gareth? What about the, the <laughs> Carolean? And they went, it sounds a bit like Charles. Yeah, we'll have that. Um, so, I mean, it, it is now, it is a time of, I suppose, the morning is over. And it's now a time of still reflection, but it's also a time now of celebration for our new king, King Charles III, and the challenges that he's got ahead of him. But we want to talk today about hope, and in particular, the hope that Charles has in Jesus. Tell us about this. Mm, that's right. I mean, the thing that was... Um, uh, in the last week, as we've been speaking about the Queen's reign, so much it's become so clear that her faith was fundamental core to um, to everything that she was and how she reigned. And her funeral just demonstrated that. And I think it was very encouraging to hear how um, the Archbishop Wellesby talks about how it was who she had her faith in. Uh, the person of Jesus, who Charles also has his faith in. And I think that was just encouraging for us at the sense that the core, the reason why um, the Queen was the way she was, uh, is carried forward by Charles because he also follows the same person in Jesus. And that gives us such great hope that um, he is being guided by um, the King of Kings. He's being guided by um, the Lord of all things, you know, by God who loves us and um, is compassionate and gracious. And that was a mark of the Queen's reign. I think she was compassionate and gracious. And that's what we're hoping, I think, to see from Charles's reign, that he will also be a person who is compassionate and gracious. We know he's passionate about many things. Uh, you know, we've seen through his life and somebody said it's the longest apprenticeship ever he's now just taking on his job at the age of 73 but we know that he's been passionate about many things education young people uh, the environment um but our prayer for him my prayer for him is that really it be rooted and founded in who he follows and as a person who follows jesus and there must be so much stress on his plate it's a bit like when um, a child has got a famous parent, whether it's in sports, whether it's in filming, there will always be those comparisons of it. Well, they're not as good as the mum. They're not as good as the dad. <laughs> oh, goodness. And, I mean, it is, it must be in a way an impossible boot to fill. Yeah. yeah. Having that, I mean, to be honest, Charles is 74, 75, yeah. is he? He's 73, so, 74, something like that. You know, 
God save the king, as we say, and we hope that he has a long and fruitful reign, but it will not be as long as his mum. It will not be 75 years old. It is impossible. So she had a lot of time to, I suppose, experience the role. He will not have as long. Mm. But we do pray for him, and we do hope that he is as open about his faith as his mother was, as you mm-hmm. said. It mm-hmm. was in the Queen's speech. It was a King's speech at Christmas. How strange right. will that be? Right. We do hope right. that he mentions his faith and all this kind of stuff because he needs our prayers most certainly because there's going to be a shift, I think, a real shift in what people think about the monarchy. Mm-hmm. We hope that after all these celebrations, it's brought us all together a lot more and we do mm-hmm. actually appreciate, you know, the important role that the monarch play and how respected they are around the whole world. I mean, I heard the stats that 60% of the world watched the funeral, 60% of the world. And the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, he now holds the record for the most watched sermon ever. It's just (laughs) incredible, isn't it? But I think it's really important that we allow Charles to lead as Charles. He can't be a second Elizabeth. He needs to lead um, and reign as Charles the third. Can you believe that's 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 who we now is our king? But I I do we do pray for him. We he needs wisdom. He needs strength. Um, I think he's shown in the last week his commitment to be close to people just through not only going around the four nations but being doing his walkabouts and it people say he wants a slim down more kind of informal relaxed monarchy and so i think i think he'll he'll do a good job and i think people want him to do a good job um and also this is interesting uh he's very keen on taking care of the environment he's actually got a car and you can search this out online that works off spare chardonnay he's got a car which is not powered by petrol or diesel i don't know if he has it now he's king but a few years ago in an interview he was talking about how to help the environment he's got a car that runs off spare chardonnay that is classy how much much spare chardonnay must he need just to get from a to b and who on earth ever apart from a king and a prince would ever be able to have a car that is powered off wine because to us wine is more expensive than fuel but to him (laughs) he must have his own vineyard and it must mean that it's actually cheaper for him to do that than it is have a car that works off diesel or petrol incredible and then the questions arise of does he actually put it in the bottle and then have spares in the back in case he runs out and he breaks down and he needs to top it up again (laughs) has he got a bottle opener honestly the questions could just go on and on and on so many questions Leslie it's been an absolute pleasure and I suppose we haven't really uh, touched upon very much on Agape UK but you know who they are they're one of our partners search them out there on the socials and it's all about discovering Jesus together and communicating the truth of Jesus Christ in a normal down-to-earth way agape.org.uk always a pleasure Leslie take care see you